Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be doing a walkthrough for the Kronos Hack the Box machine, where before I've kind of said some of these boxes on the easy side straddle the medium line, I think this medium level box straddles the easy line. So if you're looking to break into the medium territory on these machines, this is a great first box to do it on. We're going to be using tools like Burp Suite, Dig, and creating reverse shells, as well as kind of gathering some open source intel to figure out where we can do some privilege escalation. So with that, why don't we get started? You know that I typically run my own startup script that creates my directory and my notes file, as well as runs a basic nmap script. But I've already done that to save us some time. So you can see right off the bat what we have open. We have port 22, we have port 53, we have port 80. So we have SSH, DNS, and HTTP. Why don't we take a look at the HTTP? Right off the bat, we can see that it's a default page for Apache 2 Ubuntu. And really, you're not going to find a lot here. You're going to look at this. If you do Go Buster, it'll return the server status and it'll return this page. That's it. Uh, it's a default configuration, so nothing's really been done with it off the bat. So, right, port 80, not a lot there. We could view the page source if you wanted to. See if there's anything in terms of comments or in terms of developer notes that might be of use to us, uh, things like this. But really, you're not going to find anything on this box. So take a look at it, familiarize yourself with it, but don't really hone in on it for this in particular. What I do see is that we have port 53 open. So why don't we try and do some DNS enumeration? To do that, we're going to use dig, which is a tool that kind of queries the DNS name servers for information about host addresses. It'll give you mail servers, name servers, exchange information. Like This tool is typically used for zone transferring and will provide some valuable input for us here. So we're going to do dig axfr, and then it's chronos.hackbox. Then you'll do a space at 10.10.10.13. Now, a lot of people right off the bat with the dig axfr commands, they don't put a space between chronos.hatlabox at 10.10.10.13. So what will happen is it'll fail and people will ignore it. I'll show you. So if I go like this, we'll see if a command doesn't work and a transfer failed. But that's just because people like to treat it like SSH. So put that space in there and we'll pop out with some interesting results showing We've got the default chronos.hackbox. We've got admin.chronos.hackbox. What appears to be a name server one dot chronos.hackbox and www.chronos.hackbox. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add each of these into my Etsy host file. Okay, we'll do admin dot chronos.hackbox, we'll do www.chronos.hackbox, we'll do what's the name server one dot chronos.hackbox, anything else, admin ns1, www, regular chronos as well, chronos.hackbox. All right, so Kronos takes us to this interesting page, but if you look at this, all these links appear to take us off-site. It's taking us to live web pages. It's not taking us anywhere internal to this box. And when I was doing this the first time, the first thing I did was I went to the GitHub page and I pulled through a Git clone all of this information and looked for any kind of default credentials. Just to have, um, I think anytime you have access to an API or resources like this, it's important to pull it and just save it as a just in case uh, because eventually you might hit a wall and coming back to this level of configuration to really understand what's going on in the box is never a bad idea. But that's only one of three or four different hosts that we were able to figure out uh, had names on this box. So why don't we try NS1? It takes us back to this page. Nothing really uh, exciting there. Why don't we try www.chronos.hackabox? 
back here. And last but not least, the one I'm sure everyone saw right off the bat, Kronos uh, hack the box with admin in front of it. All right, great. We've got a login page and an advertisement. Perfect. Let's take a look at the source real quick. Nothing interesting in the way of comments. Try admin, password. All right, nothing really important there. It's just logon name, password's invalid. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to test and see if we can get away with any kind of SQL injection into the username. So the first thing we are going to do at that point is if you're using the Firefox on Kali, you're gonna go down to preferences, network settings, and configure your manual proxy configuration to yourself. So 127.0.0.1, port 8080. The next thing you're gonna do, change that to burp, and we're going to go burp suite. Delete those, close that out, and start a new temporary project with burp defaults. All right. So now we're back at the admin and logon page and I'm gonna type in admin and I'm gonna type in password. And realistically, it does not matter what you put in right now because the proxy is gonna intercept it and we're gonna change it up. So once we get over to Burp Suite, you'll see that the proxy right here is now orange. And you can see where we just put in admin and password. And if you right click, we can send this to intruder. What Intruder is going to do is going to allow us to alter this payload and kind of submit our own requests in order to determine whether or not this is vulnerable to SQL injection. But the first thing I want to do here is clear all of these. And I only want admin to be my altered parameter here, so I'm going to add over admin after selecting it. Next, we'll go to the payload. And at this point, we're going to load in a word list. What I did was I went to wfuzz. Word lists, injections, and SQL. That automatically loads in a bunch of shots for us to take at this machine in order to test whether or not we're gonna get away with any kind of SQL injection. So we have our position set up for admin, we have our payload set up for word list, we have our target set up, I think it's time we start this attack. That's okay, this is community edition. And now you can see these status 200s are all gonna indicate the errors, nothing really interesting is gonna happen there. What we're keeping an eye on here are status code 302s and a different length, stuff that will differentiate the failures from the successes. And even still, sometimes you'll see a status code 302 and it might not be a success, but for now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna let this run. It's going through 125 examples and it's going to give us different uh, outputs depending on whether it fails or succeeds. And you can see we have our first status code 302, which is the apostrophe or zero equals zero pound. Sometimes when this works, in our favor, we can look at a response and look at a render, but in this case, the Burp Suite is not able to render a response on this. It is very useful when it is able to render a response because it basically creates its own sub website for you to look at and see whether or not you got in. You can also look at the request itself, but for now, we're just gonna take a look at these uh, 302s and I think I'm gonna stop it here because we have two different 302s and 200 all the way down to 46. So the first thing I want to do though is just grab this because while I could open it in Burp Suite, I kind of just want to be able to uh, keep it on the side so that I have it in my notes for later. If I have to reference it again, I want to be able to close out Burp Suite when I'm done with this. So I'm done, I'm just gonna cancel this attack now. Close out Burp Suite. And do not forget 
to switch your network settings back that will cause problems. Reset for admin. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this SQL injection right here. I'm going to type in whatever I want for password. Hey, how are you? And I'm in. I'm going to sign out. I'm going to test admin password again. Okay, that still fails. I'm going to try this. And I'm going to say hooey. And I'm in. So what you can see here is that both of those worked and it showed us that they worked via the SQL injection that we used Burp Suite for while still maintaining those original credentials were not working. So what we have now that we can see is a web interface that allows us to execute one of two commands, trace route and ping. If we execute ping, see what happens. Looks like it sent one ping to 8.8.8.8, .8 which is the Google server. Traceroute does the same thing. If you view page source, you can see, I don't even know that this actually sends that. But let's try this. Now, one of the default or early lessons that you learn in Linux is that you can run multiple commands at the same time. So if I wanted to do ping.8.8.8, .8 I could. I wanted to do ping.8.8.8 .8 and ls. Now I'm pinging and you see over here that I've listed my directory so that I can see what's inside of it. But ping is still going. So the ampersand symbol allows us to do things like that. I'm going to say ls. Would you look at that? We have that. I'm gonna stick with trace route though. And because trace route I actually don't think does anything here. But now you can see here that we have uh, a default list of what directory? Var WW admin. We can do some level of traversal here and enumeration if we really want. I think there's two ways that we might want to move forward here. Um, you can technically jump straight into the user flag from this if you wanted. So I'll show you how. We'll do cat etsy password. So now you see we have the etsy password file, which will kind of let us look at what usernames might be on the box. We see Nolus. That's a Pretty name for user. Let's do that. That's the one that jumps out at me as the most likely to be a user on the box. And another way you can kind of test that is to do ls slash home, which will give us any user directories. You see we have Nolus there. If we wanted to, we can do ls slash home slash Nolus. And look at that, you can see we have user.txt. So now we go cat home nolus user.txt. And there's our flag for me first. Now that's only one way in which you can set up user.txt without actually even getting into shell. I'm going to show you the other way by creating a reverse shell. So the first thing I want to do on my end is I'm going to set up a netcat listener on 4545. That's my port of choice here. I'm going to go to my cheat sheets because I can't be bothered to remember everything and look at what we've got for different options for reverse shells. Now, I went through each one of these options and some of them worked, some of them didn't. I recommend taking the time to actually try to do each of them, but for now I'm only going to do a Perl one. Netcat was not on the machine, so that one didn't work. Python actually crashed it for me, so beware when you try that. But for now, I'm going to do this Perl command. 
got to go back first to the beginning and get your IP address set up. And choose your port. Then when I execute, I've got shell. But if I do sudo l, you'll see I don't have a full shell, which is where my other cheat sheet. I highly recommend, by the way, you have a cheat sheet directory for little things like this, because if you're talking to someone and they remember all of this off the bat, that's great. But I think maybe 75 to 90 percent of people, I'm not going to remember each and every one of these methods to spawning a shell. It's just how it is. It's how I work. Okay, so I appear to at least have gotten a full shell. Time to do some enumeration and see what we can do here. First, we'll go back to home, nullis, cat, user.txt, and there's the user flag there. So I showed you two different ways that we could have seen user.txt. Now we need to get root. Let's first see if we can actually get there. Can't see any to root. All right, so user.txt, not really anything past that that we can do right now. So it's time to start gathering some information on the box. First thing we're going to do is we're going to do uname a. You can see we're running Linux Kronos 44072. Now I'm going to grab what release information I can get. And we can see that we're running Ubuntu 1604. So why don't we take our way over to exploit db where we have two options here we can search for linux 4.0.0 or i'm sorry 4.4.0 and we're given quite a few options for our privilege escalation which is nice or we can go ubuntu 16.04.2 And you can see here, but I'm sorry, wrong one. Here we go. You can see here that we have a privilege escalation. This is great. It's run in C. And it should be something that we can kind of make use of for ourselves. So why don't I do this? You always have two options with exploit db. You can just download a file or you can make it yourself. So because this isn't compiled yet, we're going to need to compile it with using GCC first and then dash o for the output. Uh, and I'm going to name it Kenobi. All right. Great. So we have that file. It appears as though everything's great. I'm going to do now Python. I've now created my own simple HTTP server in this directory, which means that when I go back here, I can do wget. Okay, so I can't write it because I'm in the root directory, which is silly of me to have done that. Why don't I go back to where we started? I'm gonna go to var ww admin. Now I'm going to do that same command. You can see we have Kenobi now. But when you look at it, it's not executable anymore. So we're going to go charmod plus x Kenobi. Now I'm going to dot slash Kenobi. And would you look at that? I'm in root. And there's our root flag. 
I highly encourage you to look at some of those other exploits that I had shown up earlier. I haven't really had a chance to test them all, but you know, it's great to not rely on any of these and I'm very happy that we were able to do this without Metasploit. There was one Metasploit module that I saw using a different uh, set of vulnerabilities, which I think we probably could do by creating a reverse shell back to the multi-handler listener and then setting the session into that Metasploit module. But since I'm doing OSAP, I don't want to use Metasploit if I can't help it. Um, trying to be a little bit better than that. So for now, I just want to thank you for watching, and I hope this was informational for you and helpful in your own process. I have the second episode of Patch Me Up in the process of being done right now. I've got a few virtual machines that I've spun up in which I'm testing the Eternal Blue exploits and Eternal Red exploits, and hoping to really kind of demonstrate why that was such a big threat and why it still is. I hope to see you next time, and I'm sorry for wasting your time. Have a good day.